the future has already arrived and we have heard that uh, the United Kingdom is especially interesting in this respect and I cannot but agree and I'm very happy and pleased that Sir Ernest Ryder, senior president of the tribunals of the United Kingdom, will speak about securing open justice. This is a keynote speak of this evening. Sir Ernest, thank you very much that you make it. The floor is yours. Your Excellency, uh, President of the Supreme Court, Professor, distinguished guests, it's a real pleasure um, to have been asked to speak today and thank you for the quality of the discussion that we have all been listening to um, all afternoon and to the early evening. Uh, it is early evening and so the full text of this paper with all the footnotes and all the cross-references are on the usual websites from the Institute and from the England and Wales Judiciary. Um, so sit back and just let me take you on a little journey to where the United Kingdom, or at least England and Wales, has already gone. By way of an introduction, let me start with the obvious propositions. Open justice is central to all of our justice systems. It's more than that. It's of fundamental importance to democratic government. If I can borrow from President Woodrow Wilson, our courts are the balance wheel of our constitutions. They maintain political liberty and the rule of law. Without effective open justice, they would not be able to do so. This might seem at first glance rather a bold claim for what many may take to be no more than the principle of publicity. But as you've heard all day today, <clears throat> it's not a bold claim. Open justice is more than the principle of publicity. I take it to encompass three related principles that I'd like to just discuss. First, it encompasses the principle of equal access to courts. Unless courts are genuinely open to all those, whether individuals, businesses, state entities, governments, local and central, who need to vindicate their rights, we weaken at best and fail at worst to make good our commitment to democratic government. In the United Kingdom, this point has recently and forcefully been expressed in the Supreme Court. In the case of the Crown on the application of unison uh, against the Lord Chancellor, Lord Reid explained, not that many of us would think it needed explanation, how without unimpeded access to the courts, laws are liable to become a dead letter. In turn, as he put it, that renders the work done by Parliament nugatory, and the democratic election of members of Parliament a meaningless charade. We're at that level of discussion. We've been there all day. <clears throat> it's unfortunately a continuing truism that for large numbers of individuals and businesses, and actually for some public sector actors, the doors of our courts and tribunals remain closed. The right of access is theoretical. To the extent that they are, we can say following Lord Reid, then there is a democratic deficit. We are taking steps to remedy this problem in the United Kingdom in different ways in England and Wales, in Scotland uh, and in Northern Ireland through bold systemic reform and digitization of court and tribunal process, which I want to return to uh, in a moment. It is, however, particularly important that we do so for another reason. In their recent book on the development of online dispute resolution, Digital Justice, Ethan Katch and Orna Rabinovich Ini outlined the sheer number of disputes that are already being resolved online by private dispute resolution services, such as those used by eBay and Amazon. The numbers are staggering eBay resolves 60 million and more disputes each year. The systems are reported to be effective. They produce settlements that the parties are happy with, and they provide procedures that are said to be intelligible and uh, comprehensible uh, to the user. For those of you that know what the white book is uh, in England and Wales, 
uh, the Bible of the Civil Lawyer, which is now into two volumes printed on toilet paper of over a thousand pages each in eight-point type. Before you even start to read it, you will know that it is neither intelligible nor comprehensible. Uh, and given my sittings in the Civil Division of the Court of Appeal in England and Wales, that includes to most lawyers who have to use it. There are serious arguments uh, underpinning their work that our justice systems could not properly deal with the number of disputes these digital systems deal with now, uh, nor provide an equivalent user experience. At the moment, those arguments are likely to be correct. There is also a persuasive argument that from a public policy perspective, we should not encourage all such disputes to come before the courts. I'm going to be careful, particularly in the face of uh, my close professional colleague, Dame Hazel Gen. I'm not suggesting that we lose the inestimable benefit of the public uh, recitation of judgment and precedent that the common law uh, has derived its very authority uh, from. But peaceful, mutually agreed settlement is in the public interest as much as resolution through court determination and judgment. It is one thing, however, to accept that there's a public interest in the promotion of settlement. It is quite another to accept that such disputes are not or could not be made capable of being brought before the courts. To accept the second proposition is to accept that we are moving towards a society where there are digital outlaws, individuals and businesses whose disputes are outside the law's protection and control. We would thereby improperly uh, accept, I suggest, that dispute resolution should be outsourced by the state to algorithms designed to the specification of private users. We would be acquiescing in the privatization of justice, or to borrow from Owen Fiss, it would be capitulation to the conditions of digital society. If we're properly committed to open justice in the first sense I have outlined, we cannot accept that this is or should be the case. On the contrary, if we are to ensure that courts and tribunals meet society's current demands for justice, we cannot but configure them so that such claims are capable of being tried and adjudicated effectively. If we do not, we undermine both judicial independence and the rule of law. This places a significant onus on the judiciary as an institution of the state to act. Open justice's second aspect is the one which we are all uh, immediately familiar with. It is that courts and their judgments uh, should, indeed must, be open to scrutiny by the public and the media. Followers of Bentham will know why. Hasn't Bentham been quoted rather, rather extensively today? <laughs> it is, of course, that publicity, openness is the great antiseptic that is, as Bentham had it, the very soul of justice, the keenest spur to exertion and the surest of all guards against imp improbity. It keeps the judge while trying uh, under trial. If I was to ask one of my colleagues sitting in the family division of the High Court in England and Wales, where the majority of all process is private, it's held in chambers, whether their behaviour is the same uh, when they move into open court and, for example, sit as an additional member of the Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. if they were to answer that question honestly, yes, of course it is. <coughs> the language changes. Your body language changes. Your behaviour to people changes. You are under scrutiny. Put one of those judges into a constitution of three in the Court of Appeal, and it changes even if we're in private, which is a very, very rare event in England and Wales, because you're under scrutiny by two of your colleagues. I simply don't accept that public scrutiny does not change behaviour. A judge observed while judging is an attentive judge. As Lord Newberg, a master of the rules, noted in the case of Arawi, he or she is a democratically accountable judge. Again, if we simply accept the argument that private online dispute resolution is the way in which the majority of disputes, and in some areas all disputes, may be resolved in future, 
we will accept this loss of accountability. We would further accept the growth of a democratic deficit. And the same is the case if we divert public justice to an unobservable online forum. Digital courts must be open courts. As a board director of the courts and tribunal service that runs uh, England and Wales uh, courts, I have to sometimes remind my colleagues of that rather important uh, principle. That, after all, is why one has judged members of such boards. Open justice's third aspect is, again, one uh, we are all familiar with. Open justice through accessibly written public judgments are the means through which the courts fulfil the role, again, if I can borrow from Owen Fiss, of explicating and giving force to the values embodied in authoritative texts such as our constitutions and statutes. They interpret, communicate and develop our public social values. Again, as most recently emphasised by Lord Reid, judgments help to provide clarity and certainty in terms of our legal framework, the framework without which the social and economic development of society would not be able to take place effectively. They create the shadow of the law within which we order our lives. Linking back to the first and second aspects, surely this helps stimulate public democratic debate. And the importance of this latter aspect, a concept I shall call observational, justice should not be underestimated in the face of the tendency otherwise to irrational populism or at least populist propositions that are incapable of empirical validation. That's the world we're all living in at the moment, whether we're enemies of the people or observers of a presidential address. Against this background, I want to focus on the question of what steps the judiciary should take to secure open justice. And in doing so, I want to look particularly at our duty to secure open justice and how that duty should be implemented. I have to give the usual disclaimer. I'm one of five presidents or chief justices in the United Kingdom, so I have to stress that my remarks uh, are in the context of the United Kingdom tribunal system of which I'm the senior president. My colleagues may fundamentally disagree with me for all I know, but I have more than 60 jurisdictions, 14 chambers, and more than 6,000 judges and judicial office holders in what is frankly quite a small island. Um, there's quite a lot of law uh, going on. <laughs> Let me turn to the judiciary's duty to secure open justice. We have a clear constitutional duty to secure open justice. That's not a matter of debate. It is recognised as such in the House of Lords decision in Scott and Scott in 1913, um, and affirmed by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom in Al Rawi, when the court held that the courts could not, in developing the common law, do so in a way that permitted the creation of secret hearings, ones which admitted of no public participation or accountability and contravened fundamental aspects of party participation in proceedings. In any event, uh, whilst it might still be relevant to us, it's inherent in Article 6 um, of the Convention. Our Rawi uh, makes good reading still. I recommend it. These and other such decisions, of which there are many, affirming the constitutional right of access to justice, are, however, focused on what the judiciary is required to do in exercising its judicial functions. The judiciary's duty is not, I would suggest, limited to just that. As Lord Diplock put it, it is a function of government to maintain courts of law to which its citizens can have access for the impartial decision of disputes as to their legal rights and obligations. Different countries can and do take different approaches to how their government carries out this duty. The way in which our constitutional settlement now operates is one of active partnership between the executive in the form of ministers of more than one parliament and the judiciary in running the courts. It is, it is one of, quote, two separate but equal branches working together to manage the courts and judiciary, unquote. This interdependent relationship is manifested in a number of ways. 
each of which emphasizes the active role the judiciary must play in securing the proper administration of open justice. Let me outline the specific aspects of this duty and the way in which it's carried out in partnership with other branches of the state in the United Kingdom. First, as a matter of common law, it is the judiciary that exercises the court's inherent jurisdiction to govern the court's processes. This was and is still the power to issue practice directions or guidance judgments governing the court's procedure and practice. The jurisdiction permits the senior judiciary to prescribe both rules in the broad sense governing practice uh, in our courts, but equally enables it to make provision for the effective administration of the courts themselves. Second, the judiciary in partnership with the executive and parliament is responsible for the administration of those courts and tribunals. This is carried out in England and Wales by way of an express partnership between the Lord Chancellor, whichever one we have today, uh, for the executive, the Lord Chief Justice, uh, and for the tribunals, myself. The Lord Chancellor is under the specific statutory duty to provide sufficient court and tribunal buildings uh, and staff from Parliament <laughs> to secure funds for the proper administration of justice. The Lord Chief Justice and myself are under statutory duties requiring us to secure the effective deployment of the judiciary, to provide effective training, guidance and welfare provision for our colleagues and to represent their views to the executive and ultimately to Parliament. In Scotland, as they will frequently remind me, there is no Lord Chancellor. The remit of that office does not run. There hasn't been one since 1700 and whenever. And the partnership is therefore, um, so far as the tribunals are concerned, between myself and the parliaments, two parliaments, the United Kingdom Parliament and the Scottish Parliament. That is an interesting uh, and fairly brutal personal uh, relationship. I have nobody to mediate it, nobody to broker it, but the statutory duties um, are the same. The constitutional partnership in England and Wales is brokered, not just by the three of us, uh, but by Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, which is the body that provides uh, a day-to-day -day service for us. I also have a number of specific duties which require me to ensure that I carry out what I need to do in a particular way, uh, namely to provide tribunals that are accessible, that is, open, and their judges have to be expert, their proceedings fair, speedy and efficient, and perhaps most significantly, I have a duty that none of my colleagues have, which is to develop innovative methods of resolving disputes that are of a type that may be brought before tribunals. Put simply, in an online world, um, if my colleagues produce rules or processes that are not as good as the ones that the tribunals can produce, if we can do it better, I have a constitu constitutional duty not to do what my court's colleagues want me to do, to go off and do something different, and I would submit better. Put it the other way around, they needn't follow me, but if we find a better way of doing it, I have a duty to put it in place, whether they like it um, or not. It, it seems to me that although these duties have been given statutory form, their duties inherent in the senior tribunals a senior president's leadership role for tribunals, but equally of my colleague, the Lord Chief Justice's uh, role in the courts. The Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief Justice and myself have joint and several responsibility for the appointment of judges, which you'll come to tomorrow. And that includes for promoting diversity within the judiciary um, and uh, for enforcing uh, judicial discipline. Open justice requires an open judiciary to which any member of society can be appointed on merit, one in which every part of our democratic society can see they have a stake. We should therefore ensure that proper and properly open processes are in place to implement um, those responsibilities. For the first time ever in the United Kingdom, um, I now have uh, a judiciary in the tribunals that is a proper reflection of the society from which it comes. It's taken 
uh, the t my two predecessors and myself a considerable uh, number of years to get to that point. But we're proud of it. If you're talking about confidence and trust in the judiciary, observational justice as a concept, it has to include what people think of what you are doing, what their perceptions of you are um, in the broader society. If I can draw these strands together, they demonstrate an inescapable conclusion. The judiciary cannot sit on its hands. It's under a wide range of specific duties, each of which in its own way requires um, us to secure open justice in each of its facets. As such, there are aspects of a wider general duty which require the judiciary to be as active in reform and in leading reform and modernization of the justice system today as they have been historically. And I want to move on to that, if I may, uh, shortly. How best to implement the duty today? Well, there are two areas in which I believe the judi judiciary must act to answer the question. Governance and policy, and then separately reform. In governance, during the course of two public lectures last year, which are examples themselves of the judiciary communicating its views in a, demo in a democratic society outside of our individual judgments, the last Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas, outlined the basic requirement. He said that judiciaries have both internal cohesion and good uh, governance, and that without such structures, the judiciary would not be able to carry out its duty effectively. We have flexibility to devise our own structures and an, a concomitant responsibility. Respective Lords Chief Justice and Senior Presidents have done so. It is of central importance that those structures are subject to principled review, they should not be fixed in stone. As with any large-scale organisation, systems become outmoded or inadequate. As times change, systems must also change. They may no longer be appropriate for the society they serve. And two questions then arise. First, is the structure that is in place optimal? In the tribunals, for example, I have an executive body that supports me. It's a board. It's constituted of representatives of all of my judges, and within the tribunals themselves, leadership is provided by presidents and their deputies. That was the right structure in 2007 when the unified structure was brought together. But the more that the judiciary as an institution um, is forced to take policy decisions, uh, then the more it has to think about its duty to secure uh, open justice within those policies? And is the structure that we've got still the right structure? Might it need to be expanded, as was suggested over 30 years ago, into a more collegiate uh, body of judges, which is the commonplace um, in the United States uh, or in most European countries? Should it include representatives of the legal profession and civil society among its membership? There are benefits of having non-executive directors um, on boards. They're well recognized um, in government, just as they are in business. Is there any merit in drawing on those benefits for judicial governance? And through this form of engagement, uh, to improve our accessibility to society in general. For example, I have recently reformed an administrative justice council uh, for the United Kingdom which I will chair, that is independent of the executive and parliament, with an academic board to advise upon governance and policy in the law and research in relating to the issues that will inevitably arise. Secondly is the management right. The senior judiciary is very fortunate uh, in the United Kingdom to be supported by excellent civil servants in the form of judicial offices. They come under the aegis of the Ministry of Justice for England and Wales, but consistent with the principle of judicial independence, their members work to the judiciary and not to ministers. Should we not also be taking steps to consider whether and in what ways we might need to reform the structure of support we receive? Is the structure right? Do we know anything about management techniques, in particular workload management? welfare and human resources? Is the training of our support uh, appropriate? Is the training of our judges in relation to that support appropriate? 
do we need to ensure that all those who support the judiciary are familiar with the digital world? If our courts and tribunals are to be, and they will be in the future in the UK, digital by default and design, then we all need to be properly trained. If, for instance, my executive board is to consider properly policy decisions concerning the redesign of tribunals, including an online tribunal system, its advice needs to be fully informed. Greater experience in the digital world will not only ensure that our advice is up to date, but equally it will enable those giving advice to be able to go beyond simply reviewing material. It will enable them to see connections, propose developments and improvements that might not otherwise be obvious or come to light. And just as any company or industry must learn from the latest management techniques, must keep abreast of the latest technological developments and invest accordingly in them, so must the judiciary. The judiciary are practised in the incremental development of the common law, which is an analogous process. But we are judges. We are not historically trained in leadership or management, a point which Richard Posner has recently and interestingly written about. As he put it, management skills are often not positively correlated with judicial ability. <laughs> you do not need to have to engage in the esoteric delights of the economy of law to readily see the truth in that statement. That must change. The right structure and the right support is not enough. I return to what more is needed in a moment. I do so because it also raises questions of transparency and accountability that, that you've been debating this afternoon. May I touch on those now and first transparency. It is important that the public can understand the role that judiciary plays in society. That judicial independence is in some parts being viewed as something which is a matter of judicial self-interest is as dangerous uh, as it is worrying. It's not an optional extra that can be discarded according to the fashion of the day. That judicial independence is not understood to exist as it does for the benefit of the public, for society as a whole, is a matter which needs to be combated if we are to maintain our commitment to the rule of law. That is the President's visibility point. We have no option but to be proactive about it. It is also, however, important that society understands how the judiciary is run and organised. Transparency in so far as it does not impair judicial independence, and that is a hugely important caveat, will help understanding. In doing so, it may also improve scrutiny. Scrutiny may well prompt debate concerning our leadership and our structures. It may point out issues that, looking at matters internally, we have missed or downplayed. It will help inform the judiciary as much as it will the public to the benefit of all. Second, accountability. It is well established that the courts and judiciary are accountable in a number of ways. Appellate accountability for decisions. Explanatory accountability on the part of myself and the Lord Chief as leaders of our respected judiciaries in the system. Remedial accountability to ensure that we lead reform. Democratic accountability through public procedures and judgments and disciplinary accountability. As the judiciary as an institution enters more into the policy arena, it becomes difficult not to grapple with the question of how it is to be accountable for policy decisions. Equally, as the judiciary as an institution works in partnership, as we do in England and Wales, uh, in the courts and tribunal service, the question has arisen as to our account accountability as judges for implementing decisions taken not by us, but by government. We're in a partnership with that involves uh, having to agree. It's a joint venture. Don't think we've ever been quite in that position before. Perhaps we were if you went back to the vision at the beginning of today when the king's justice was administered under the tree in the name of the king by the king's servants. 
Historically, the answer to the first point would have been to say that as head of judiciary and government minister, the Lord Chancellor was accountable to Parliament for such policy matters. But in 2005 and again in 2007, there were constitutional and tribunal reforms that laid a new foundation for increased responsibility on the judiciary to develop policy for the administration of our courts and justice generally, and they reformed the Lord Chancellor's role, removing um, the protected role that he previously had. If, as they do, the judiciary have leadership duties, so must they have responsibilities and accountability. The latter must, however, continue to be informed by the principle of judicial independence. It must not undermine our institutional independence. It's perhaps time then for consideration to be given to the adoption, for example, of some parts of the United States model of accountability when one looks at, for example, the administrative office uh, there. One can ask the question, is such a step, step more consistent with both the changed role of the judiciary and our duty to secure open justice? Moving then to policy, because by now the constitutional pure purists among you will be revolting at the idea that the judiciary should involve itself in any more policy than they have hitherto been involved in. You may take the view that the judiciary should not be involved in the implementation of government-led reforms. Well, there are two points that perhaps should be made. First, it is wrong to assume that the judiciary, government and parliament are in some way hermetically sealed away from each other. They're not. They must and do work together. They're interdependent, albeit that they must each be careful to ensure they do not overreach into each other's exclusive provinces. Developing and implementing policies concerning the effective administration of justice does not or should not overreach. Ensuring judges are trained for the modern world, ensuring judges' welfare is supported, ensuring judges are deployed to the right places in the right jurisdictions with the right support within a financial settlement negotiated by someone. It is by two or three of us um, with government and ultimately parliament. Ensuring that our courts and tribunals are open to the public. A failure to develop proper policies in these areas and to secure them would be an abdication of our responsibility. Second, our constitutional settlement gives joint responsibility to the government and the judiciary. As it does so, it cannot but be the case that the judiciary works in partnership with government to effect reform. The judiciary may not and should not be responsible or involved in the formulation of government policy or legislative policy. That would be overreaching. But once that policy has been established, we must not forget both the government and parliament are democratically accountable for their policy decisions and the partnership requires the judiciary to work with them. To that extent, Professor Figgis and I might at least agree. In acting in this way, the judiciary must, however, be guided by principle. It was once said by Lord Palmerston, Britain had no permanent allies, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. The judiciary has and only has permanent interests, which are to secure the effective administration of justice. This must guide and determine all policy choices that we make through our leadership and management structures. Is there a practical way, um, in principle, of undertaking this task? Well, I would suggest that the concept of proportionality has to be a practical guide. It may not be the only one. If I am right, then the achievement of our aim can be done through an application of the approach articulated by Lord Wilson in the Supreme Court um, in the Crown on the application of Quilla and the Secretary of State for the Home Department in 2012. If I adapt to that for present purposes, it requires four factors to be applied. First, does the policy objective further open justice? Second, are the proposed implementation measures designed to implement the objective rationally connected to it? Third, are they no more than necessary to accomplish the objective? 
And fourth, do they strike a fair balance between the rights of the individual and the interests um, of the community? Only if one takes some criteria-based application to public policy can one be rational um, and reasoned, and that is an example. So in examining our future approach, we should adopt clear guiding principles such as these and apply them. A clear statement of the judiciary's permanent interests and the test by which it carries out its duties to further those interests will not only be will better enable the public to understand us, but equally other branches of the state. It will also provide a means by which the judiciary can test its own internal structures and secure principled continuity in its own long-term governance. Finally, coming to reform. The development and application of principle and up-to-date management methods is of fundamental importance to reform. We must adopt a far more rigorous approach to this than has been the case in the past. We must because judges, while adept at researching the law, are not by and large trained in the skills of empirical scientific research. They are not well versed in dispute systems design. They do not necessarily understand, certainly my judges do not necessarily understand, or appreciate the connections or potential connections between the courts, the legal profession, <coughs> ombud schemes, and so on. They're not necessarily at home in a digital world in terms of either design or implementation. Sir Michael Briggs, as he then was, whose excellent report is ushering in the digitization of our civil courts, is perhaps the last judge who will be in a position to carry out a detailed review of the type that he did. We have now be moved beyond judges simply summarizing what they think is good practice. We're in a new world, one that will and does require the judiciary to take a more considered approach. We cannot lead reform as an exercise in the ad hoc. To understand, design and test reform, we must, I would suggest, engage far more than we have in the past with academia uh, and with experts and with wider society. Reform should be based upon research, robust and tested. It should consider the latest design techniques. It should be open to scrutiny and be communicated clearly and readily to the judiciary, government, parliament, the professions and the wider public. It should require us to consider whether our processes are sufficient to modern conditions. Which of our processes should change? Which may fall by the historical wayside? If we're to secure open justice, all questions must be capable of being asked and examined, but examined properly. The judiciary must therefore support, promote and commission research. Just as the unexamined life is one not worth living, the unexamined and unresearched reform it may not be worth taking. Presently, there is a lot of talk about digitizing or rebooting justice. ODR is increasingly transforming formal justice systems, and there are systems far ahead uh, of the United Kingdom. Experience in Canada, in its civil resolution tribunal, um, our own experience in developing an online civil court, but watching what individual states and the United States of America have done, uh, demonstrate that to us. They are but examples of a more widespread phenomenon, phenomenon. Such developments must not undermine open justice in any of its facets. On the contrary, digitization must make our courts more uh, open. Uh, online resolution should be a way of opening up the justice space, not closing it down. It should be used to make process and hearings more accessible. It should be used to make judgments, which in turn should be clearer and simpler, more accessible. More importantly, digitization provides us with an opportunity to devise a new underdeveloped aspect of open justice. It is openness that comes from effective feedback. Perhaps there are two aspects. The first is that it provides the opportunity to adopt one of the features of ODR that has made it so successful. As Barton and Bebus explain, one of the inherent advantages of ODR, as it has been developed, is that it can facilitate learning. 
Due to the amount of information that is gathered, we are able to discern patterns, identify weaknesses, and consequently redesign, implement, and measure the efficacies of the changes we put forward. It is the ultimate in data-led reform. Digitisation will, if we're sensible, provide us with the opportunity to gather data on the operation of our justice systems in ways that we have often been unable to before. Uh, our justice systems can become more adaptive only after proper scrutiny and discussion of such data. In a foundation of which I'm a trustee, which commissions research into the justice system, the Nuffield Foundation, we are trying to identify the outcomes in the real world, the social care outcomes that might be relevant to track from this data uh, over time. And second, it provides us with the opportunity to reorient justice systems so they not only become more accessible and thus more able to deliver justice, particularly for those who would otherwise be digital outlaws. Many of those are already outlaws to the system. Their vulnerabilities or their finances simply prevent them um, accessing us. It provides the opportunity to enable the widespread sy systemic problems in the application of the law to come to light through enabling the creation of feedback between the justice system, um, regulatory bodies, ombud schemes and the like. It will provide us with the opportunity to bring to light and public scrutiny systemic weaknesses in the rule of law, <coughs> providing an enhanced means to promote public debate, to highlight how and where public values uh, instantiated in the law are not being developed as Parliament intended, and to provide observational justice. It will thus increase the ability of the courts and tribunals to promote the rule of law. The creation of such feedback is something uh, I'm actively pursuing in the digitization of the United Kingdom uh, tribunals. We have an opportunity to broaden and deepen our commitment to open justice through that process. We shouldn't let this unique opportunity slip uh, through our fingers without questioning what we could and should do. In conclusion, I know I've only been able to outline some of the issues You've each been struggling with the huge volume of things you want to say um, all day. Likewise, and my apologies for having the same difficulty. It is, I believe, important we continue to develop open justice uh, through the 21st century. If we're to ensure that our courts and tribunals fulfil their constitutional role and that we as judges ensure that they and their processes are not unexamined, that we lead reform in the light of evidence and through the proper use um, of expertise. Most importantly, we must ensure that we fulfil our duties and responsibilities as effectively as we can in order to secure open justice uh, for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sir Ernest Ryder, for giving this perspective to uh, this uh, conference. Uh, the justice system is part of the democratic society. It has adapted itself to the needs of uh, the modern society, implement the changes, and these changes are also chances. And we should take them up. But we have also <coughs> some time to lose uh, something, and we have to be aware. So I think this is a little bit uh, what we have heard today, the whole afternoon. We have touched upon different issues, many points. We have to reflect. And uh, reflection is easier if there is something to digest outside. <laughs> You find a glass of wine, <laughs> some sparkling wine, something in addition. And I hope to see you again tomorrow morning for the second day of the conference. Thank you again very much. Thanks. <laughs>